Good morning. Welcome to our annual question and answers service. So you asked the questions. We had the honor of sifting through it, praying through it, distilling what we should answer, just to get a heartbeat for what y'all are asking around your dinner tables. Our heart behind all of this is just to shepherd y'all. We know that there are things that you have questions about that you may be intimidated in asking because you look at us and we're up here and we have ministries we're running or we're talking through the Bible throughout the whole year. That's actually what we do here at CLB is we take a book, we go through it. And so over years, we'll indirectly, quote unquote, answer all these cultural questions. We don't live in a vacuum, we recognize that, but there are things that are really pertinent within the church that y'all are talking about, issues you want wisdom on around your dining room table. So with that being said, that's our heart. We wanna come together. We wanna provide biblical wisdom and answers. And then your job is to discern if those are true or not. So with that being said, this was our heart behind it all. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 10. It's gonna describe the first Christian missionaries, Paul and Silas here. They traveled, verse 10, to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue, and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. Now, here's where it is, church. This is something to focus on today. They, meaning the Bereans, searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. As a result, many Jews believed as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. Jews meaning those who were the people of God up to that time and those who were not, that being Greeks. So with that being said, our heart behind all of it is to shepherd y'all into wisdom, biblical truth, and this is our effort in doing so. So before we get started, just wanna pray because we desire for us to be a church of Bereans knowing that the blessing is on the other side of knowing truth and being able to explain truth to others. So Jesus, we thank you for your truth. We are grateful and we are thankful for all the blessings and gifts that you've given to the church. You've given us wisdom, knowledge, but we also know that apart from you and your fruit of, fruit of humility, we will err on the side of arrogance. We desire to be a people who are both spirit-led and word-fed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, fellas. Anyone got the questions up here? Right here. Go ahead, Just. All right, so this is kind of intro question, um, just to get to know us a little bit. It was a question submitted that says, it's assumed you actively study to lead the church body. Curious to know what you are actively studying to lead your own home as husband and father. And so uh, I can go ahead and start us off with that question. If you don't know me, Justin, um, yeah, personally in my own study, um, I guess I can tell you what I do for my daily rhythm and then maybe who I listen to and read. Um, so my current rhythm is I'm in a psalm, a proverb, a gospel, and an epistle every morning. I like to see the full spectrum of Jesus being uh, kind of predicted. I like to get godly wisdom that's practical, see that wisdom and the prophetic of Jesus actually coming in the gospel, and then the practicals on this side of the cross in an epistle. That's just a rhythm I've done. I recommend that to people. Um, maybe if you're asking who I listen to, um, Big John Piper guy. Uh, these guys make fun of me all the time because I love him. He's, uh, I think, just well-balanced as a, a solid biblical teacher, um, but uh, he's just one of those people who loves God as his treasure, and, and that's just very much uh, how I see God and relate to him because of that. So um, the, the other person I listen to is Mark Driscoll. Uh, he's got some great Real Men series. Um, I think he's just really practical and biblical, and I just really enjoy, uh, especially as a husband and father through that series. Hey, my name is Glenn, serve as one of the, the pastors here, and I do everything Justin does, plus an extra two hours of devoted prayer. <laughs> you'll, you'll get there, buddy. Um, no, right now, one of the things I'm, I'm doing that um, has, been, has been really good for me is I'm reading a book that was gifted to me called How a Husband Speaks. And the whole premise of the book is communication is the number one thing that everything else flows from in marriage. And so that's been a really helpful tool for me. Um, day to day, practically speaking, I think learning my wife um, and I, context, um, I live in a sorority. 
I have a wife and three daughters, so there's, I'm the only place with testosterone in my home. And so um, learning and listening a lot to uh, emotions and trying to grow intelligence there is a place that I think God has uniquely called me. So, Hey, y'all. One of the pastors here, Roy. Uh, I'm the opposite. I got five boys and one girl. So we, we're, we're very active right now in our household. Um, the people that I study and learn from is the question to run our and lead our households. Uh, number one is mentorship is huge in my story personally. So who I talk to is my father-in-law. Um, you'll know him by his fruit, right? So he has uh, six kids. They all follow and love Jesus. They all serve the body. Um, and so I, when I met him, I was like, man, I got to know what the secret sauce is. And the secret sauce was this guy waking up extremely early in the morning before his household woke up. I would catch him on my way to work at 5 a.m. And he would have, uh, it'd be dark in the living room and he would have a light on him reading his Bible. And this guy at the time was a president of a bank. What use does he have for a quote Bible? It's not like it's a manual for him to quote succeed. Okay, this, I'm being facetious here. The number one thing in his life and what produced success in all areas of life, especially his family and raising kids, was that he spent a lot of quality time with God. And it was the beginning of his day. So that always stuck out to me. He's my mentor in terms of being a husband and a father. Number two is I got a lot of instructions given to me when I first became a Christian that had to do with what it means to be a Christian. So then when I became a husband, I was like, what, where, where can I find the instructions on how to be successful as a husband and a father? For all you husbands and fathers, I'm going to go through this real quickly and then we'll move on. But these are our job descriptions. It's been a part of how I know if I have success or not. So this is the word here. Ephesians 5.25 tells us to be sacrificial husbands. Uh, 1 Peter 3 verse 7 is an empathetic husband. That is, I'll read it here. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your brides. Treat your brides with understanding as you live together. That's living in empathy and compassion with the opposite sex, which doesn't come naturally to us. And yet God commands us to do so. Uh, it says that our brides may be the weaker vessel, but she's an equal partner in the gift of life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. There's extra incentive to treat our brides with empathy so that our prayers would not be hindered. Last two, mentally tough husbands. That comes from 1 Peter 4, verse 19. So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you, for he will never fail you. Marriage is difficult. Raising children is difficult. To go back to the designer consistently for his wisdom and his strength is the key to persevering. And so that's why I've just said, man, that's, that's a part of my job description as a husband and a, and a parent. Last thing is uh, for uh, disciplinarian and instruction as a father. And then lastly for a uh, father is Lamentations 2.19. Fathers, we're going to miss out on a ton of stuff already. We've missed out on making mistakes. We will, quote, ruin our children. No ands, if, or buts about it. But... What is a blessing is the promise that God can fill those gaps. With that being said, Lamentations 2 verse 19, it comes through prayer. Rise during the night and cry out. Pour out your hearts like waters to the Lord. Lift up your hands to him in prayer, pleading for your children. Intercessors are what each and every husband and mothers are called to be. Because we will mess up, but the God of the universe will cover over those things and protect our failures so that our children children will see the grace and they'll live out of that grace and give us grace as they grow older and see that we were human. Sound good, church? Amen. All right, let's go to the next question. You can read it, it's yours. Okay, cool. All right, this one's for me. Am I, this question was sent in, a bad Christian for making a lot of money? Then there was a Bible verse that was quoted here. For it is easier for a camel to fit in the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. How do I interpret this verse while pursuing the means 
to provide for my family and my, ki- and my future for my kids? That is such a valid question. I, I just wanna point out a couple things just to distinguish what a bad and a good Christian is and what is a more healthy and biblical way to understand the question. The word bad or good just smells a little bit off biblically. Um, to be clear, our relationship with God, our Father, if we've chosen to follow Jesus, it's just not based on performance. Not based on, so whether you're quote good or bad or a fa- failure or success, that's not on God's grid in terms of his judgment of us, in terms of this issue. He doesn't see us as bad. He just sees us in seasons when we disobey as disobedient children. <laughs> And the grace in it all, just like with human children, is that we can go from disobedient children to obedient children and receive blessing by repentance, confessing that we were off and then turning away from that and then following him again. So it's not good or bad. It's whether we're obedient or whether we're disobedient with certain things as God uh, being our father. Uh, So with that being said, I'm going to answer this question in terms of a disobedient Christian instead of bad. Um, You're not a bad Christian for making a lot of money. Making a lot of money has nothing to do with your status as an obedient or disobedient son or daughter of God. Money is actually a good thing, a good resource that God's given us. There's nothing inherently wrong with money. The issue is the love of money. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Real quick, uh, just watched uh, Sound of Freedom with my bride this past, yeah, this past week. And you could just see as you were watching, it's, it's just a, a movie that has to do with the, the realities. It was based off a true story of the trafficking industry around the world. And you can see in it that all of these imagers of God, these people who are trafficking kids, you can see they're motivated by money. And that's what's pointed out here. It's the love of money for all kinds of evil. Let me continue on. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many, many sorrows. So money is an interesting thing, a good thing in and of itself because it does a lot of stuff. It gets us status, it gets us comfort, lifestyle. It fulfills our needs. And in other words, if we're honest, it makes life easier in a lot of ways. <laughs> and it makes it more enjoyable in a lot of ways. And because of that reality, we and our hearts, our desires are the issue because we're going to be tempted to hoard that money that we've earned. And whether it's hoarding or whether it's sin against others to earn more of it, both of those things are wrong. Both of those things end up giving God as our father a sorrow in his heart. So God intended money to provide for all of our needs. Think housing, think food and wants, which I know is going to sound crazy, but cars (laughs) and also trivial things. I'm speaking as, as, as a, a a global perspective here, not just American trivial things like lawn service. My family has lawn service because if not, you're going to get a brown yard when you drive by my house. That's just not my thing. So I don't want anyone to ever feel guilty for making a lot, buku amounts of money. The issue is not whether you earn a lot or a little. The issue is what are you doing with it? So uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 7, uh, this talks about a God-honoring way to steward money. Verse seven, you must each decide in your hearts how much to give. Not if you're gonna give, how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Quote, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. He has an affection specifically towards those who take the money that they've earned and they give it away cheerfully. So giving away our money is a God honors, honoring thing and specifically it's to God honoring ministries. That's what the scriptures entail for us to honor God with our money. It blesses us also by reminding us that the money that we've earned is actually not ours, it's God's. Haggai 2 verse eight reads, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And also he's the one who gave us our jobs, Deuteronomy 8 verse 18. But remember the Lord, your God, for it is he who gives you the ability 
to produce wealth. So here's the conclusion, church. Earn as much money as you can because it increases your giving more than your living. All of us love what comes with money because it increases our lifestyles. Biblically speaking, God wants to say, yeah, I get that. Use it in that way. But also have a greater mindset that when you earn more money, be glad that you can give more money away. If you have that church as your guiding principle, you're going to be a cheerful giver and God will have his affections towards you that much more. Very last thing, sorry boys, I'm hogging the mic. The, the passage from Mark 10 that uh, the question brought up, that actually was in the context of a non-Christian approaching Jesus asking, what do I gotta do to become a Christian? Jesus saw that this guy was a rich man and he saw that possessions and money were grabbing his heart. In other words, they were his God. So then he, he looks into this guy's heart with a word of knowledge and he says, you know what, at the end of the day, forget about all the commands that you have kept and haven't kept. Give away all your money. And the rich ruler walks away. Why? Because he was, Jesus was asking him to remove the God of his heart off of the, off of the seat of his heart and asking God then to enthrone his heart and to be the number one authority in his life. So, the other principle that comes along with that whole scenario is that just to remember, hey, money is funny. It does funny things to our heart. And it's going to, even if you are a, a Christian, it's going to continually tell you lies to be like, save me. Don't give me away. Spend it on luxury. Instead of just being obedient to God and honoring him with his giving, having that as your guiding principle is going to be what's most helpful in honoring God. The next question is, if I have a friend who is somewhat open to the gospel, but I sense isn't quite ready, what should I do? Um, and so I wanted to open this by giving you a little bit of background for me. I spent years on college campuses approaching strangers and sharing the gospel with them. And um, if I could go back in time, I might change a little bit of my methodology on, on how I did that. Uh, one of the things that was very common in my era of evangelism or um, sharing the, the, the gospel message and inviting people to respond, soul winning, whatever, it was, was um, tools that would present a certain uh, you know, few facts about the gospel message and basically put it on the person on the spot right there. Do you accept this or do you reject this, right? Do you believe this or do you deny this? And oftentimes if someone, you know, would, would deny it, it was kind of like, oh, okay. And if somebody would accept it, it was kind of like, oh, okay. And you, you, there wasn't necessarily a ton of follow-up, a lot of, uh, you would either walk away ready for the next one or you would walk away really, really encouraged because God did something miraculous right before your eyes. And so the question is a really good one because many of us, if not all of us, have people in our lives whom we love, who we have sensed for a while are somewhat open to the, the gospel, but we don't know if they're quite ready. And so I would give a, a few encouragements. Um, number one is if you are fixed here thinking strategically how you will have the next conversation with them, you're already off to the wrong start. Get on your knees and pray. Pray for that person. Make a habit to mention their name to God and to ask the Lord to bring them to salvation. Uh, God is the God of salvation. We don't have control over the choices that someone makes, but the Holy Spirit can, can woo. The Holy Spirit can bring spiritual life where there's death. The Holy Spirit can convince and convict. And so pray, pray, pray. That's number one. Number two is stay present. Uh, it's, it's not very easy to pick up where you left off with somebody and, and continue to appeal Christ to them if you're not in their life at all. And you're only seeing them once every six months. Uh, I myself have experienced that. So as you pray, you tell me whether or not it makes you want to spend more time with that person. So pray, stay present in their life. They need a model. They need someone who continues to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their life. Because it might be 
that you're kind of the only Christian that they know, you're the only person who's born again that they know, and so you have an amazing opportunity to represent Christ as an ambassador that way. Number three is have conversations that meet that person where they are. I would recommend a tool that you have heard us in one way, shape, or form preach before, um, and, and we would love, I think, in the future probably to do a training on this, but it's a tool called Step Up to Life. And what it presents is steps that every person in the world can find themselves on in their respect to God. It begins with a person being unconcerned. The next step is that they become concerned. The next step is that they become convicted. The next step is repentance. And finally, saving faith. And the beauty of a tool like this, all three of us have made use of this in our life, is that it lets you help someone identify where they are on those steps, and you can sit on the same step for months with someone. And each time you come back to a conversation with them, you press in on, on have you moved to the next step? And here is the reason conviction, right in the middle of those steps, is the biggest turning point. It comes out of 2 Corinthians. It is chapter 7, verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So what we would argue is that at the end of the day, um, a person is either going to be grieved and convicted by their sin against God and the chasm and the gap and the lack of relationship and the darkness that's there rather than the horizontal consequences of bad decisions that they've made. That is the difference between worldly grief, which is I'm experiencing the ramifications of sin in my life, and it, it's really bad. And godly grief, which is, Lord, I've sinned against you and you only. There is no relationship here. I want that. I fear you, and I want to have relationship with you. And so if you go to Step Up to Life, Google it. You can see that as a tool and explore that. It's a great opportunity. Um, many times, all three of us have used that tool to end conversations with someone where they've not accepted or rejected, but they've remained on the step that they're on. And it gives us something to come back to each time we're with that person. It helps us to be long-suffering in our evangelism, and it helps us to have compassion that's ongoing in our evangelism. That's good. That's good. Uh, next question. Uh, how do we reach the LGBTQ community? If they believe love is love and we say God is love, how do we reach them in a way that in fact shows God is love, but love isn't love, and doing it in a way that they'll see and understand? How do we reach those who can't believe or understand that an LGBTQ person won't go to heaven unless they repent of their sins and turn towards God like we all do? Um, so I see a few different questions within this big question. So I want to answer this in three different parts. Uh, first one, none of us can redefine God's love or truth. Uh, and we know that as Christians that uh, God's word is truth. Um, and so when we hear things like uh, love is love or even that's your truth, uh, this is my truth, uh, those kind of phrases, we kind of have to really hear what's underneath those. Uh, many times we as humans, all of us are guilty of this, uh, we usually try to find ways to justify our selfish desires. And when we hear things like that being said, many times that's a way to cover up uh, pride, uh, rebellion against God that is blatant and outright. Uh, but I also want to point us maybe a different perspective that we haven't considered. There can also be underneath that uh, fear. There can be loneliness, there can be confusion, and maybe even sorrow behind this. Uh, and so I think when we come into these conversations and we feel like this is our fight as Christians, we really need to see that this is not uh, the fight that we think it is, I think, many times. We need to come with compassion. I think we need to come with patience uh, and, and a lot of sympathy, right? Jesus says that he can sympathize with all of our weaknesses, and we should be the same as Christ. And so um, many times when we enter in these conversations, it's showing uh, the end goal that we're trying to get them to see that there's something so much better than what any of us can come up with or settle for left to our own devices. So that's the first part. The second part, I say sometimes I think as Christians, we put on too much pressure on ourselves when it comes to this specific topic. Uh, we need to remember that these people are fellow image bearers and people. 
They are humans just like you and I, made and loved by God. I think uh, when it comes to this specific issue too, uh, we can, the church can become guilty of, whether we're aware of it or not, becoming kind of modern day Pharisees. Uh, and we can kind of treat people who struggle with uh, homosexual desires and attractions uh, like the modern day lepers and prostitutes and tax collectors, uh, the very people that Jesus himself would have been drawn to the most. And so when we enter in uh, keeping that mindset as Christians and, and love in our hearts for them, um, I would also say that the main goal um, in reaching the LGBTQ Q community uh, is not simply to settle for modifying a lifestyle or a behavior. Uh, that falls way short of what the gospel message is. Uh, it's actually to get these people to know and love and trust the person and work of Jesus with the full counsel of God's word. And what I mean by that is not only focusing on what God condemns, uh, but rather getting them to see and highlight what God offers instead. Um, and the Holy Spirit's job it's not our job. Like We are not the Holy Spirit, so we leave it up to him that through our conversation, through our grace, through our love with these people, uh, that he will be the one to bring conviction and actually begin to transform a person's life. Uh, the third and last way I'd answer this question, um, practically, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, right? That's what we are to be as Christians. Uh, I think many times we can fixate on the one key difference that we have with these people rather than focusing on all the other ways we can actually relate to these people. Uh, guess what? These people like food. They probably like coffee just like you. So take them out for coffee if you know them. If you have a coworker, if you have a family member, a friend who struggles with these desires, uh, invite them over for dinner. Ask questions and don't make assumptions. Uh, we also need to understand there are so many unseen spiritual battles that these people fight uh, that we don't know. We don't know the rest of their story. We don't know their upbringing. We don't know their background with family or friends. Uh, we don't know their understanding and view of God. And so all of those things kind of pour into a person, just like they pour into each one of us in this room. That is what has made us and gotten us to where we are currently. Um, so I'd say in that time when you're actually sitting down with them, if they're willing, uh, share your story. Share your testimony as you're asking questions. Let them see that as a Christian, you have weaknesses. You have current wrestles with sin yourself, uh, that you don't have it all together. Um, I would also say then if they're not willing, if it seems very adamant, pushback, uh, in your face, blatantly disrespectful, uh, again, remember our wrestle is not against flesh and blood. This is not a wrestle against them. They are not the real enemy. There is a true enemy that hates this person who hates you and is going to create division and confusion. And so what can you do? Just like Glenn said, pray. Before you enter any conversations, pray, ask God, how should I come into this? Make my heart compassionate and loving. And lastly, I'd say, in the end of all this, do not write these people off. Their story is not done. God is pursuing them. He loves them. Um, and you have no idea how even one impactful conversation could have down the road. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. All right. I have a follow-up question that was sent here. And it says, can I be gay and still be saved? First part of the question, can I be gay? I just want to make sure whether you're homo or heterosexual, your sexual preference is not your identity. Just want to clarify that in case anyone was wondering or whoever asked this, can I be, can I be gay? Um, I think out there in the world, the patterns of this world and uh, lies of this world would love to tell us that who we spend our time with in our beds, our identity, but it's just not true biblically. And so with that being said, the, the, the next part of the question is still saved. Just to bring clarity, a person is saved by faith. It is a trust that Jesus is the Messiah, God in the flesh. He lived a perfect life. He died. He arose again on the third day. And you believe that he came to save you because you acknowledge that you are a sinner who was separated from God, born that way. We're all clear there. On the other side of that salvation cone, if one side is faith, the other side is repentance. It's a condition, it's not a work, it's a condition that's met, faith and repentance. Uh, 
think uh, John the baptizer said, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. So it's just that, in other words, there should be a lifestyle that shows that the spirit of God is within you. So whether we struggle with homosexuality, uh, drunkenness, adultery, when we get saved, those things should not be our slave masters anymore. We should not identify as those things anymore. We identify as being a blood-bought, free son and daughter of Christ the Most High. Amen? Now, the Apostle Paul does give clarity on who we're going to see in heaven, just to bring clarity here. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, he says this, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will inherit the kingdom of God? And then he's going to give a list of what those wrong things are. And he says, don't fool yourselves. In other words, church, when you read this list, don't fool yourselves. Don't try to justify in our minds that these sins that are being explained can do anything other than what Paul is describing it as, which is to keep us out of the kingdom of God, of heaven, after our last dying breath, and a close relationship with him right now. And this is what he says. Those who indulge, that's the word, key operating word, who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols, or commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheap people. None of these people who are, quote, indulging, practicing, like you're active in it. None of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Amen, church? All of us have stuff that we were once owned by, and yet the Holy Spirit occupies our hearts, our desires, our affections, our emotions, our feelings, and he gets rid of those things, and he makes this thing true right here, which is this description that said, all of these things, if you indulge in these things, they, they separate us from God. They're sin, and they keep us away from God too. And that's the repercussion we have to uh, pay. So if someone is practicing homosexuality, then yes, don't, let's not be fooled. By the end of our days, if that's us in this room, then don't expect for us to inherit heaven, to be face-to-face with God if we are actively, proactively living that life out, indulging in those things, just as those who indulge in adultery and never repent of those things, or idol worship, fill in the blank. So yes, if you're proactively in that sin in particular without repenting, then yes, that is the consequence. Now I want to separate that from same-sex attraction. Because there are a lot of people who have a same-sex attraction, whether you were, whether we agree or disagree, whether a person's born with it or not, it's something that's come natural to you. That same-sex attraction, if you, we, or you do not act on that, that's not sin. It's something that a person can honor God with if they either get delivered from that same-sex attraction and stay unmarried or get married to a female, or if they continually stay um, single, a lifelong single, and you continue to just fight those thoughts off and don't entertain those thoughts. So I do want to give a shout out to some of the most mentally tough born-again people in this world, and that's the Christian who truly is born again, who's not actively acting on their preference to be in a homosexual relationship. Like we have to recognize that there are some Christians who get born again yet still are tempted into those things and praise God, they don't act on them. So same sex attraction, right? Not acting on it, praise God. Those who are acting on it, there's a caution here. I love this next one because I think it is, um, it's really pertinent to our context here at City Light Bennington. The question is, what is the difference between a Catholic 
and an evangelical. So um, Catholicism is, has a rich history in, in Omaha and in Nebraska. Um, the word evangelical is a little um, unclear, so I, I want to bring a little bit of clarity to that first. Um, evangelicalism, which comes from the word um, euangelion, which means good news, is the idea of a person who believes in the good news of Jesus and proclaims that good news. So um, evangelicalism finds its roots underneath the umbrella of what is more traditionally separate and distinct from Catholicism, which is Protestantism. We are a Protestant church. That is our heritage. <laughs> so um, what I want to do in answering the question is I want to walk us through five or six, what I believe are very key differences between uh, Catholic doctrine and Protestant doctrine. So the first comes down to the issue of authority. Um, Protestants have long held that the authority belongs to the Word of God. Uh, we, like Roy said in opening our time together, are Bereans. We search the scriptures and that is where we derive our authority. Uh, we believe in the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture, uh, which means that Scripture is understandable. It's something that um, we can make sense of in reading, that the Bible is not a Gnostic, mysterious book that leaves us with a billion questions about the essentials of our faith. In Catholicism, more specifically Roman Catholicism, um, there is a magisterium, which is a... Um, it's a ruling teaching uh, order of uh, cardinals, and it ultimately is headed by the Pope. Uh, the Pope is viewed as the vicar of Christ. He is the representative of Jesus on this earth, and this authority is bound up in this, this magisterium. Um, every interpretation of Scripture can ultimately be decided there. Um, all of, of Catholicism's uh, united uh, takes on cultural issues are decided there. Um, and where that can go wrong and become dangerous, as we've even seen recently, is when that ruling body makes a decision that is clearly against the Word of God. All of a sudden, you lack the freedom as an individual to choose, as Protestants can, to go to the Word of God and to come up with your interpretation, your conclusion of what it teaches. So that's number one is the issue of authority. Number two is tradition. Um, we hear Jesus talk about tradition in, in negative ways, the traditions of men, often when he's talking to Pharisees. Um, the, the history of the Roman Catholic Church is not that Scripture is the authority alone. Uh, in fact, in the Catholic Catechism, it states that the church does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Um, and so Protestants only view the Word of God as the authority. Uh, Roman Catholicism does not. Number three, salvation and grace. Um, Protestants often express salvation by faith alone in Jesus. It's through God's grace alone. It's through faith in Jesus, his finished work. In fact, Protestants believe, as we often preach from our pulpit here, that faith in Jesus means for a person that his righteousness is imputed or given to that person. That when someone places their faith in Jesus, they bow their knee to him, they trust in him, that the righteousness that he lived with, which was perfect, can be attributed to that person's account. And God then sees that person clothed in the righteousness of Christ. This is part of the good news that we rejoice in as believers, is that our sin does not condemn us. Um, at the end of the day, trust in Jesus covers us and forgives us. Um, but the assertion that justification is a, is a specific point in time um, is not true in Catholic doctrine. Uh, what the Roman Catholic Church believes is that justification is a 
process and it is dependent on the ongoing grace that one receives through their participation in the church and the sacraments. And so um, there are various avenues of, of uh, means of grace. So you're saved by grace, but the, the question kind of looms how you receive that grace, what that grace does. Um, Protestants view justification as the moment God declares that a guilty person is righteous because of what Christ has done. Um, what the Roman Catholic Church rejects is that there is that imputed righteousness from Christ at the moment of salvation. Sanctification, then, is the process in the Protestant view of being made more righteous throughout your life. You've already been declared righteous. You've already been justified. And now the sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit to make you more like Christ. Um, that is not necessarily the case in Catholic doctrine. So that's one, two, three. Number four is the Eucharist. You may have heard that before. Um, most of us Protestants will call that uh, communion or the Lord's Supper. We celebrate that once a month here on Sunday mornings. Um, what the Roman Catholic Church holds to is the doctrine of uh, transubstantiation. And um, what that entails is the belief that when we partake in communion, and specifically when a, um, a qualified priest declares uh, certain things over the communion that it becomes in, in our hands, the, the, the bread and the wine or the juice, the literal body and blood of Jesus. And that by a person partaking of that, it's a, it's a spiritual and physical nourish, nourishment that, you know, goes within that person, transforms them, makes them more righteous. So um, there's also views in Protestantism um, of uh, consubstantiation, which is that Jesus is really there in the midst, coexisting with the bread and wine, very present, but he's not in the actual elements. And then there's the memorial view, which is that our taking of the Lord's Supper of Communion is symbolic of um, the, the broken body of Jesus and his shed blood for our salvation. We do this in remembrance of, of him. Uh, number five is the priesthood of all believers. Huge, huge. Uh, priesthood of all believers, rather than this, this uh, vertical structure, there is really a horizontal structure. It comes down to access to God. Uh, we believe that because of what Christ has done, the veil has been torn and every individual who places their faith in Jesus can draw near to the presence of God and have communion with him. Praise God. Um, that is uh, hampered or um, sort of filtered in Catholicism through a priest who has a, an authority to uh, bind and loose demonic influence to pronounce the forgiveness of sin. But when we read in scripture, confess your sins to one another, he will be faithful to forgive. Um, what it comes down to is that we have the ability as Christians to mediate the presence of God to one another. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost does, means that no longer do we have to go to a certain building, uh, a certain place, meet with a certain person to have the fullness of communion with God. It's granted to us, and we all are priests in his kingdom. Um, last but not least is the veneration of saints and the Virgin Mary. Roman Catholics see veneration as um, a sort of praying through departed saints who will then represent your prayers with more efficacy to God. So there's another mediator that's present there. Protestants do not believe that. Um, we, we do not hold uh, Mary in this high regard where she's the queen of heaven, she's the mother of the angels, the mother of humanity. Um, there's no equivalent to that kind of veneration in Protestantism. And, and to be honest, a lot of these differences we find uh, in the, the Roman Catholic Church, they're less than biblical. There's not a sound biblical case at the end of the day to be made for some of these things, and, and frankly, they can be dangerous. And so um, I, would, I would argue that there are many um, Catholics that you and I know who are born again and saved and love Jesus and um, are in the same position that, that we are. Praise Jesus for that. Uh, they, they may not be fully aware of what the Roman Catholic Church catechism states about certain issues and where the church actually stands and what that would mean with their view then of us as Protestants. 
Um, and so that, that's our best take on the difference between Catholicism and evangelicalism. That's good. Justin, I see I have this question, why can't women be pastors? Why do I have to get all the controversial ones? <laughs> do you want to answer that one? Okay, all right. Uh, why can't women be pastors? So um, there was a presumption that women can't be pastors in this question. It's inferred. I <laughs> uh, tradition and a misunderstanding overall has jaded us from a biblical understanding of who or what a pastor is or isn't. So I'm going to talk about God's design for his church from his point of view. I'm going to read it as if it's, he's talking to one of his angels, his divine counselors, as he's back in the day making creation and, and making his church and has plans for it. And it's just going to help us really understand uh, a biblical way of how the church operates. So with that being said, I'm going to read it from his point of view. This is not scripture. This is just something to help us as a teaching tool. I am the God of order. Therefore, I will bring order to my people to bless them. I'm going to call them the church, and I will create a simple structure, really simple, but I'm sure these people are going to mess it up. They're going to make it really convoluted and hard to understand. There's going to be two, simple, simple, just two leadership roles. You know what? Humans love to add stuff, so they're going to call it offices. And, but these offices, they're going to have some authority. They're going to be elders and they're going to be deacons. Those are going to be the two authoritative roles within the church. It's going to be really clear. And uh, they must be people of high character. I'm going to put that in, in, uh, in 2 Timothy, in chapter, in chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, the deacons are going to serve as ministry leaders. The elders will govern the church and they're going to be the primary teachers so at City Light Bennington, I can already foresee their elders will be the ones who are teaching in front of the pulpit every Sunday. And I'm going to designate that elder position to be exclusively for males. Oh, I'm also going to shift or uh, going to give gifts spiritually to my people. And it's not going to be based on whether they're male or female or whether they're in a leadership role such as elders and deacons. I'm going to call them spiritual gifts. They're going to be special abilities and they're meant to bless others. And it's going to be crazy because some people in the church will overemphasize it and make it their identity. Other people will run away from it and pretend like half of them don't even exist. Isn't this funny, angels? Humans are funny. And then I'm going to give people these abilities. So some of the, these special gifts, they're going to be leadership helps or service, prophecy, exhortation or encouragement, teaching, giving, and many more gifts, uh, like pastoring, which actually means to shepherd. I'm going to give them to my people regardless of their sex or their leadership role within the church. I'm okay with the church calling its leadership elders and deacons that's going to give clarity to those who are leaders within the church so that if someone comes and visits, they're like, that's an elder, that's a deacon. But heaven forbid, angels, if the church starts calling the leadership by their spiritual gifts like pastor, oh, wouldn't that be hilarious? If people started calling Roy pastor and Glenn pastor because of their spiritual gifts, that's going to confuse everyone. And then Roy's going to have to sit up there, be asked a question and have to explain it all. That essentially is what happened, y'all. Traditions have confused us and misunderstanding over centuries. So story time's over. I just want to give scripture and stop mocking what our current situation is in America and around the world. Pastor is the Greek word poimen. It's best translated as shepherd. In other words, a pastor is meant to shepherd. It's the spiritual ability to care for people like a shepherd does for the herd of sheep. It's used 11 times in the New Testament and only three times is it used for a Christian shepherding other Christians. So take a look with, it, with me here. This one of the three times it's used as a noun to describe a person's spiritual gifting. Ephesians 4 verse 11. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors 
and the teachers. So an apostle is called an apostle here because they have an apostolic gift as their main gift. Teachers are teachers because it's their main gift in which they operate within the church. You can see how this is just all describing people, so on and so forth. So Paul's intent in writing this is to say that these people who are gifted these ways specifically are a unique gift to the church. His intent wasn't to add a leadership role or add a quote office to elders and deacons. And it also makes sense to read these verses this way as the spiritual gifts list that are describing people gifted in this way because Paul writes all these random, non-comprehensive lists of spiritual gifts throughout all of his letters to the early church. And this time he does it in a noun form, just describing the people who are gifted in these ways. So I share all of this to clarify that pastors and shepherds are among us. Within the church, within these seats, in these seats right now, regardless of your gender, regardless of your sex, tradition has convoluted the meaning of this. It is incorrectly told us that pastors are the people who get up and teach the Bible every day or every Sunday. But biblically, those are elders or overseers. Now, we're not into titles, and I said it earlier as sarcastically as I could. If we really wanted to call people in leadership by their descriptive names or what's at least biblically explicit and honorable to God, you would call me and Glenn elders. But we don't operate like that because we're within, we're within a cultural system that has a lot of tradition. So see 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 2 to see that the elders have a special gift of teaching to bless the church here at CLB. And now I want to sh shift with me to look at the two other times that the Greek word for shepherd or pastor is used, and they're used as a verb. It's a Christian pastoring, shepherding other Christians. And it's used in the context of elders, of male leadership within the congregation. Acts 20, verse 20, a, so guard yourselves and God's people, feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. Also, 1 Peter, here's the last one, 5, verse 2, care for the flock, meaning pastor the flock, meaning shepherd the flock, that God has entrusted you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Those should be read by Glenn and I as job descriptions. The, the, the character qualifications are in another place. These are our actual job descriptions of overseeing y'all. That is an elder's job description. And so Glenn and I, that's what we look at. Uh, they're not meant to be marching orders for the mom whose primary gift is shepherding your little ones, your children. It's not meant for that. So here's, just to give clarity, the conclusion based off of the things that we are convicted of biblically. All elders must have, based off of the last two verses, the spiritual gift of pastoring, also known as shepherding. But not all who have that as their main gift are called to be elders. For example, there are women across the world within churches who bless the socks off of a local church because they are pastors of kids. They are pastors of musical ministry. They're pastors of women's small groups, women's ministries. All of those are a beautiful way of females using your shepherding gift outside of your families to bless the church, to exercise authority over other females or children, not over men. That's when it becomes God dishonoring. That's how God sent up not just the order of the church, but also within the headship of the household, which we've discussed earlier here. Church, I'll be really blunt with you, we need more female shepherds. We need more women stepping up in ministries that lead other kids 
classrooms or other ministries that have to do with small grouping and leading other females. We need more females in roles of leadership. I would not read this as a, why can't we do this? This is more of a, this is how God created order so that we could fit what we're doing within the church, not argue over it and just flourish in what God has made us for. It's a beautiful thing. So just to bring clarity, CLB would be hard pressed to ever add that title of pastor to a female, not because it's unbiblical, but because it's confusing. Because traditions have set us up in a landscape to where we would have to do this whole dance that I just described every single time we would do a, a 101 of someone joining CLB. So it's not unbiblical, it's very biblical. Female pastors, if you want to uh, add that to a woman's title, as long as they're exercising that authority, not over men, totally God honoring. Elders are what you see me and Glenn as. We oversee the flock and we govern, not just that, but we're also responsible for teaching. And with that being said, I will now be going by Elder Reverend Emeritus Glenn Lawson, so feel free to call me that. Thank you. Hey, some of you may be asking, in light of that, um, the same question that was submitted here, which will be our second to last, and it is, I understand we have an advisory board, but is there any intention of creating an elder board? So I have really good news for you. Uh, we have a constitution and bylaws as a church that are finalized, that they are, um, you know, in practice. We actually do have a, an elder team. We call it an overseer team. Those are often interchangeable in the Greek. Um, and our overseer team is made up of men that Roy and I invite in who match character qualities that are in Titus chapter 1 and in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. They're also men that we uh, admire and respect and men who are not afraid to disagree with us. Uh, they're men that we want to see participating in Sunday gatherings, in city group discipleship, uh, men who are generous to the church uh, and are, are financially generous, and, and men who are serving the church uh, in, in one or more ways. Uh, the function of our overseer team includes several things, but I'll, I'll just I'll give a few key ones. Um, we have had a heart from the very beginning that we would um, not just create a business board. Um, you know, we don't even call it a board for a reason. Uh, the church is not a business. Um, it is the people of God. And so we want to have men around us who actually care for our spiritual life and care about our personal walk with Jesus. Uh, men who are going to encourage who we are uh, in the home uh, with our families and our church. Men who are going to encourage our spiritual gifts and our perseverance and our character. Uh, men who are going to pray for us. Um, does that sound selfish? It is. We want it that way. We need men to help hold us up as we, as we lead. Um, other things that, that they do is to help us make lots of decisions uh, in, in the church. Uh, really, we, we meet with them once a month, and we come together with, with these men um, and ask them all sorts of questions about uh, things both practical, things that have to do with the financial stability of the church, things that have to do with ministries in the church. Uh, and so just so you know, in case you're wondering, does City Light Bennington have elders? Yes, we do. We call it our overseer team. It is alive. It's functioning right now. Um, these are men that surround me and Roy and help us make decisions for the church. Um, they also uh, advise us in the new appointment of overseers, men that we would invite to join the team. And uh, they are responsible for adding and removing lead pastors. So um, just to help you know that that's going on in the life of our church. Uh, for timing purposes, we're going to go two more questions. How's that sound, boys? Justin, good to go. Okay, okay uh, yeah, then second to last. Um, what if you truly believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but feel you haven't been blessed with any of them? Uh, so I'll take us to 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 11. says, now there are variety of, varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who powers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. 
All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he will. So, uh, and to answer this person's question, uh, you do have a spiritual gift. Scripture is very clear. Everyone to each is given. I mean, you are gifted. Everyone who is born again, who has the Holy Spirit, has a spiritual gift for the common good of building up the church to bring us into unity and maturity in Christ. Um, We also see that there's no pressure It's the Holy Spirit. He apportions individually as he wills, meaning that you have no pressure and no shame for whatever gift you have or don't have. Uh, Most of the unseen gifts, you you may hear us talk about prophecy or tongues from stage. You'll see teaching from stage. Uh, The reason you hear about those more are because they are communicative gifts. Uh, they They involve speaking and communicating with words, whether that's a prophetic word, whether that's an interpretation of a tongue, whether that's teaching and expositing God's word with clarity. Um, those are gifts that just involve communication, so you're going to hear those communicated. But that does not mean uh, that we hold those gifts in higher esteem or higher value. Uh, actually, the opposite, if we read on in 1 Corinthians 14, 21 through 23, says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. I want to say this loud and clear publicly. Uh, We believe the unseen gifts, those quiet gifts that aren't the communicative gifts of prophecy, tongues, teaching, are actually the gifts that we give the most honor to. Uh, Meaning that if you have gifts of helps, mercy, hospitality, administration, we believe and we esteem the greater honor actually on you and those gifts than we would any of the ones you probably see from stage. And so uh, I just want to communicate that loud and clear. Um, I would say if you are wondering what your spiritual gift is, next practical step, ask yourself the questions like, what are you passionate about? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Uh, Maybe even on the opposite side, what gets you upset when you don't see it happening in the church? Uh, These gifts, again, are not meant to compare to one another, saying, uh, these are my superpowers and these are yours. They're not. They're all gifts that God gives to the church. We are meant to steward, to serve, and build up the body. So I would say, Ask yourself those questions, take a chance, jump in, see a need, and fill the gap. Uh, It's no accident that God gave you those gifts, um, and you'll never know if you don't try. Amen. Amen. All right, last one here. Why does this church, I love it, this church, uh, talk about political issues when our founding fathers believed in the separation of church and state? Our founding fathers believed in the separation of church and state, but it was intended to keep the government out of the church, not the church out of the government. The Church of England went south because of the king and the governments involved there with power usurping within the church. That's why they ended up going as Puritans, fleeing away from England. It's so funny how someone in our day, because we're so removed from the founding fathers' understanding of morality, which most of them were either deists, meaning they believed in a God, or they actually followed Jesus. Like that's the actual context. We're so far removed, we just believe like, okay, well, separation of church and state then means that both of them are to keep their hands out of one another's business. That wasn't the intent because of England's history. The intent was to keep the government's hand out of church affairs, not to keep church, meaning the people of God, out of government affairs. Government, it's all about authority. Who's the authority over the government? It is our Lord Jesus. He prescribed it that way. That's the land that we live in. That's the history, rich history that we have. Um, We started off as Judeo-Christians in terms of the land, the laws that founded all of which we live in right now, in terms of what evil is, punishing the evildoer, so on and so forth. And that is our roots. We are so far post-Christianity Uh, that the church is going to continue to shine because the culture is going that much more continually south. And it's just to be expected until the Lord's arrival. With all that being said, just wanted to give clarity. That's why we talk about government. And politics is a process of moral issues. Whatever bills are, those all have to do with governing moral issues. And politics is the process it goes to in terms of whether it's going to be written into law or not. So the whole stay away from politics is a silly thing. God has given us a moral compass to judge right and wrong according to here when we get saved. And we, we call balls and we call strikes according to his laws. They then shape what our 
laws are of the land to call righteous or unrighteous. With all that being said, we are to get in, involved in politics. We're not to have politics as our identity. And that's where we are with why our church speaks into those things because the Bible speaks into every single thing. Um, an example of that of, of uh, John the Baptizer speaking into, uh, was it King Herod's um, affair? or whatever he was going on in those days is just one of many examples, including the old prophets of the day speaking up into kings that were doing evil things. Those are just normal things of being a, a Christian now and today. So with all that being said, I'm gonna pray us out and then all y'all are gonna get your kids if you got kids. So Jesus, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word. You established your church on truth, but it's never to lack grace. We ask that we would be a humble church. Help us receive this. Help us go to your word to see if it's true and help us maintain unity through it all. May 2024 be an elevation of truth and spirit and godliness and desires to be obedient. Would you make all of us that much more increased in a desire to worship you truly? In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said... Amen. That is 2023. Questions and answers. Thanks, y'all.